this morning. There we go. Um, and welcome, um, Emma. Emma Lenz is our communications coordinator and she's helping us with all of the technical parts of this. And uh, we tested it all beforehand and it all works. So we're, we're hoping it'll be just fine for the whole thing. <laughs> uh, what else? So this is our first of our pre-convention information and worship session. Um, I'm Diakono Minister Karen Wedman and I am the chair of the Synod Council. And today with me presenting will be uh, Paul Ellison, who is our Synod uh, Treasurer, and he will be presenting the budget and the finances. Um, Bishop Larry will not be joining us today. As many of you have heard, Bishop Larry's father passed away peacefully at his home on Sunday, and so Bishop Larry has gone to be with his mom and his family at this time. But he thanks you for your prayers for his family um, as they gather to mourn while they give thanks to God. I'd like to just take a moment to acknowledge, have our land acknowledgement. In the spirit of respect, reciprocity and truth, we honor and acknowledge that across the Synod of Alberta and the territories, we live and work and play on traditional and ancestral territory of the First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. We acknowledge all nations, Indigenous and non, who live, work and play on this land and who honour and celebrate the land. So today, to improve our sound quality, I'd ask that you all remain muted unless you have a question and please use the chat box or just put up your hand and I'll be able to, to see. Vivian, it looks like you have your hand up, is that correct? See a hand, but okay, I'll just go on until she speaks back. So our time today will begin and um, conclude with worship. We'll be randomly placed in small groups. Um, and that's just so that we have a chance to get to know each other and talk a little bit about what we're expecting from the conference and and what we're expecting even from our presentation today. There will be an opportunity for Paul to give his presentation and then questions following. And please use the chat feature again which with your monitor or raise your hand and I will monitor the questions for Paul. Finally, I wanna share that we will be following our Synod's Code of Conduct policy, which can be found on the Synod website. I've asked uh, Pastor Heidi and Walter Goose to serve on that committee. And there is a uh, email address that you can send and they will respond to any, any conduct issues or any um, concerns or complaints you may have. And I'll just give that to you if you'd like to write it down. It's capital ABT, lowercase synod, capital CRT at elcic.ca. If you need that again, you can always text me and I can, or chat and I will give you that again if you need it. So today's worship was prepared by Ben Johnson Urie from Trinity Lutheran Whitehorse. He is a member of our Synod's worship and the arts ministry team. You will hear in the worship in a few moments and at the end of our time together, the voices of Ben, Caitlin, Madeline, Leo and Ari Johnston Urie. Please join in speaking with your microphones muted, the words which will appear on your screen, and join in singing when you see both text and musical notes. Today we worship with a portion of the Liturgy of the Beloved, commissioned by Bishop Larry and Kathy as a gift to the Synod of Alberta and the Territories, and created by Ben and Caitlin Johnson, Yuri. The Liturgy will be shared with our Synod text, music, and videos following the Synod Convention. So I ask Emma Dow if she will share with us um, a video of our worship. God of our beginning, from generation to generation, you have been our dwelling place our home where grace abounds. Before the mountains were born, 
Before the earth was formed, you are timeless and eternal. We first dwelled with you as divine thought, then as children born of love and breathed into fertile earth. We, your children, bear your image. Now, here, we gather in praise and remembrance of the first love. Humbled in the expanse of your sovereignty, we seek to begin anew. In the silence of our understanding, when words fail and hearts yearn to be made new, we hear you calling from the kingdom of heaven within. Return. God of our unending, your love is as boundless as the heavens. Your grace is a river that flows without ceasing. In Jesus, you weave yourself into the fabric of our humanity, divine mercy made manifest in our own time. Therefore, beloved, hear the good news. In love you were made, and to love you shall return. In the name of Jesus Christ, every distance is bridged, every division is healed, and every heart is made whole. May Christ be your heart's everlasting desire. May the words of life be ever upon your lips. Amen. We'll sing for you in starlight. We'll sing through Bro!
Beloved, Christ is our guide, with us, for us, within and throughout. Truly, the kingdom of heaven has come near. There is no future more worthy of celebration than now. O oh, day of peace, enter in. I'd like to thank Ben, Caitlin, Madeline, Leo, and Harry Johnson Urie from Trinity Lutheran Whitehorse for leading us in worship. We're now going to go into our small break, a uh, group breakouts. Um, our Synod Convention theme is One Body, One Spirit, One Hope from Ephesians 4, verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the hope of your calling. In a moment, you will be randomly sent into small groups of three or four for several minutes. During this time, would you share your name and which congregation you are a member of? Share what you first think of when you hear the convention theme, one body, one spirit, one hope. And finally, share what you are looking forward to at our Synod Convention. So share your name and congregation. Share what you first think of. When you hear the convention theme, one body, one spirit, one hope. And finally, share what you are looking forward to at our Synod Convention. After 10 minutes, you will be brought back into the larger group. So I invite Emma to put us all into groups at this time.
There we go. I believe everybody is back in. I hope you enjoyed your time together and you maybe got to meet uh, one or two people that you didn't know before. So it's always nice when we come back to the convention to be able to say hello again. Um, so we now have our presentation on Senate budgets and finances. Um, I, uh, it's my privilege to introduce Paul Ellison, our Senate treasurer. Paul has served as our treasurer since 2018. And we've all appreciated the many gifts he's shared with us and with the national and Senate treasurers from across the ELCAIC. I personally know that he has brought many um, items to the ELCIC on behalf of our Senate to try to improve the finances, um, the, the way of processing finances right throughout our um, national church. Paul will be sharing several documents on the screen. And again, if you have any questions, please use the chat features on Zoom um, and I'll monitor it or just simply raise your hands and hopefully I'll be able to see your hands. Um, and in the meantime, Paul, I welcome you to, um, to, to your presentation. Hey, thanks for the introduction. So nice to see so many people here. You're on mute, Paul. Oh. Hmm? No, he's not. No, I'm not. Hmm. Oh. Yeah, I can hear him too. And hear you. Oh, really? Why not? It's just Karen. <laughs> oh, it's just Karen. Just Karen can't hear me. Oh, that's just interesting. Can't hear you. That's weird. I wonder why. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can I can hear you fine, Paul. Oh, great. Yeah, well, so can I. Yeah. Karen, Karen's heard this before. Maybe uh uh, Emma, can you text or uh, chat with Karen and let her know that the issue's on her side? Thanks. So, um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. And uh, I know you're all super excited to go through this. The one thing that I really like about this format is the um, is joining together and, and listening to a little bit of worship before we go through this. Um, it's it's important that, um, you know, I come at this from a very accountant point of view, analytical and financial point of view, but um, we also need to remember that there's a faith part, part, part of this as well. And the worship kind of brings that in line. I know it does for me uh, before we go through this kind of stuff. So um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through uh, the financial statements with you. I'm going to share in a way that I did with our Senate Council uh, last week. Um, and I'll try and make it as understandable as possible. And so what I'll do is I'm going to uh, share my screen. And um, let's see here. Bring this up. Maybe... Uh, Heidi, can you see the financial statements on your screen? Can you give me a thumbs up? Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna make you a little bit dizzy to start with, but uh, basically these are our financial statements. Um, they're made up of uh, 16 different pages. Um, and uh, I think it's important just to kind of go through the format of, of, of the financial statements just so that you can understand them a little bit better. So there's always the title page for the financial statements. There's the index, which shows all of the following pages. And then there's the auditor's report. So the auditor, auditor's report talks about uh, if it's uh, if, if, if we basically pass the audit. Uh, there's always a qualified opinion in regards to our financial statements. And that's in regards to um, um, because there may or may not be a cash aspect of, of donations that are given to uh, charities, it's, uh, they always have to put this, uh, this note in regarding the qualified opinion. But other than that, everything, everything looked good when they did the audit, everything passed. There was no problem, no major problems or concerns that they found. So that's the auditor's report. Then there's the statement of financial position, or some of you may know it as the balance sheet. After that is the statement of revenues and expenditures. Some of you may know it as the income statement. And then there's the statement of changes in net assets or also known as the retained earnings statement. And then following that, there's a statement of cash flows, which is uh, um, not something that we really need to worry about going through. It's there for uh, accountants to feel cool and uh, 
and and spend some time looking at how the cash was spent in the organization, but we don't need to really particularly worry about that. And then following that, there's the notes to the financial statements. And so uh, each note has a purpose for, uh, with a heading regarding what it's for. And a lot of these uh, a lot of these notes tie back into the financial statements themselves. So uh, if you're, when we're looking at the financial statements, whether it be the balance sheet or the income statement, if there's ever it says note something, this is where all these notes can be found. And so that takes us through almost to the end. Um, and then there's two schedules that we always attach. There's schedule one, which is the designated gifts and re gift revenues and expenditures. And then there's the uh, a schedule to break out some expenses into a little bit more detail. Uh, and that's just for, for a better room on the on the income statement. So what all the best place to start is always the income statement. And so that's where we'll start. So the statement of revenues and ex expenditures or the income statement. And so you'll see here that I've highlighted some ex items. Excuse me, Paul. Um, yes. all, all I see on the screen is a page that says report of the treasurer, dear siblings in Christ, etc. cetera. Uh, that's all I think we see. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought it was the financial statements. My apologies. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry, is that better? Do you see a statement of revenues and expenditures? Yeah. Yes, you, great. Can you blow it up? Can you make it yeah. bigger? Can you make it bigger, Paul? Yeah, I can make it bigger. Sorry about that. Thank you. I got ahead of myself there. Okay. So I'll just run through that again real quick then. So there's a title page. There's the index. There's the auditor's report. There's the statement of financial position or the balance sheet. There's the statement of revenues and expenditures or the income statement. There's the statement of changes in net assets or retained earnings. This is that cash flow statement that we're not going to worry about. And then there's the notes start. The notes start here on page nine. So that's uh, the notes go all the way through. Sorry if I'm making anyone dizzy. Goes all the way through to note number 14. And then at the back here, we have the two schedules, the designated gifts, revenues and expenditure schedule, and then the general and administrative expenditure schedule. So why don't we go ahead and start with the income statement, which is always the best place to start. So there's, <laughs> no, that's okay. Thanks, Heidi. Um, so there's there's tons of information on here, um, uh, and there's a couple things you need to understand about our financial statements that are kind of strange. So the first is is that these synod financial statements are not just for the synod; they actually include the Lutheran Campus Ministry Edmonton as well. And so. Um, um, when, when we're looking at this, the, the, both entities are included in these financial statements. But where possible and, and, and where we're allowed by financial rules, I, we've tried to break out the Lutheran Campus Ministry uh, income and expenses. Um, and we've also engaged, um, engaged the auditor to do a separate report uh, uh, just for the... Um, uh, just for uh, Lutheran Campus Ministry Edmonton. So, um, so what I've done here is I've really tried to highlight like the items that we're we're most concerned about when we're working on a operating budget for the Senate. So I'll I'll quickly go through some of these other items just so you understand what they are. So um, designated gifts, so Schedule One. These are these are gifts that are received. Uh, from uh, either individuals or from congregations that are to or that flow through the synod to other organizations. So you can see that the designated gift income of one hundred twenty thousand is the same as the designated gift expense of one hundred twenty thousand. So it's the money in and the money out. And if we look at the schedule one, 
we can see what that 120 is comprised of. So this schedule supports that line item showing where this money went to. <clears throat> so for example, during the year, there's $92,000 that was received uh, and then forwarded directly to CLWR. And then there was money that was received and forwarded to campus ministries. Um, and so the, that's kind of, this shows you the breakdown of what happened during the year. You'll notice that there's a difference or a decrease from the 2022, and that's primarily because of two things. The first is that there was some uh, special offerings for Lakeland Lutheran Church in Cold Lake after it had the fire. So that was about $8,000. And then the bigger increase is the CLWR decrease, went, uh, decreased went from 136 to 92,000. And the, the, the significant portion of that is because of the, uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, there was the special appeal in 2022. So that's that's why there was such a bigger amount in 2022. So that's a, that's a perfect example of how when you're looking at these financial statements and you see a, a comment after, you know, okay, if I go to that schedule or I go to that note, that's going to show me what's there. So designated gifts always cancel each other out. The restricted always cancels each other's out. So restricted, note 10, $287,000 in, $287,000 out. So again, those are a wash. So if we go look at note number 10, when we go into note 10, you'll see that there's a breakdown of all these different uh, funds that, we, that, the, uh, that the Senate has money for, uh, what the balances were at the beginning of the year, what was received and what was recognized as revenue during the year. So when we say recognized as revenue, we're always recognizing these funds, whatever the expenditures are, that's what we're recognizing as revenue during the year. So uh, a good example of that is, um, uh, for example, the, the estate of Beverly M. Born, um, there was money that came in during the year. This is probably some uh, probably interest income or investment income. And then $10,000 of that was recognized as an expense during the year. So it, it, so it shows the opening, what came in, what was recognized as revenue to offset the expense, and then the closing for the year. And then you'll see that's broken down here separately as LCM Edmonton. They have their own uh, the, as an entity, they have their own reserve fund for something, and that's why that's been broken out separately. All of these other funds are held, are essentially held by the Senate in trust or in, in uh, for future use by whatever the direction of these deferred contributions are. So those, can, so those amounts always cancel each other out. Um, the other ones that are always kind of in and outs are things like the National Convention or the, 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 our Senate Convention. It'll show the revenues and the expenses. Uh, the study conference is always the income and the expense down below. Um, and then, um, the, again, the Lutheran Campus Ministry Edmonton is shown uh, income in and, and expenses out. Um, it should be noted that this is, again, just there's some complexity with the Lutheran Campus Ministry Edmonton lines. And the reason for that is that um, because, because the two, because our Synod financial statements are combined with Lutheran Campus Ministry Edmonton, this isn't actually their true income um, because the financial statements have to remove uh, money given from the Synod to LCM Edmonton. And the reason for that is you can't show income from yourself. So there's a, a little bit of complexity with how that's shown. Um, and then the Edmonton Community Foundation income, most of that is paid out either through the campus ministry supports um, and some of it is is uh, used in some of our um, uh, Lutheran campus ministry expense there. So in a nutshell, those are kind of, that's how all these non-highlighted items work. So what we really want to focus on are the items that are highlighted in green. And then this one item up here, this benevolence contributions one time. So I'll start with the benevolence contributions one time. I've had this broken out specially now. So th these are funds that have been received 
from uh, from for the most part church church closures that we have earmarked to to uh, to the Ponder a New Vision Fund. So the Ponder a New Vision Fund is a new uh, is a new fund that was set up during the year as a follow up to our Ponder a New events across across the uh, province. And these funds have been internal, internally restricted, which means that we could only use them in certain ways. And so that's why I've had these, these contributions broken out separately because they don't affect our operating budget. Um, they're basically the money comes in, but then it's put directly into the Ponder a New Vision Fund for use in different ways. So uh, if we just focus on the green highlighted items, um, and actually, maybe what I'll do is sit before we go into the next step. Does anybody have any questions so far about what we've looked at? You can. Is there anyone in the chat that's writing stuff? Yeah, these are all saying that it was the wrong stuff, so that's good. Does nobody? Does anybody have any questions? Okay, perfect. So. What we what we want to look at is the, the green highlighted items. So the green highlighted items are what I affect what affect what I call our operating budget. So um, so the, the benevolence contributions um, are is funds that have come in uh, mm -hmm. to the synod. Investment income is is uh, interest uh, that's been earned on GICs, for example, that are operational. There's our um, national church support. So this is money sent to ELCIC National. There's theological seminary support. So these are funds that we donate to them. The campus ministry support isn't exactly correct uh, because it, because of the uh, LCM Edmonton numbers, it kind of messes up what's in here, but essentially uh, this is pretty close to the number that the Synod uh, gives to um, uh, the different uh, campus ministries across Alberta. And then the general and administrative, that's the schedule two. So this is the this is the one that ties into the schedule two at the back here. So you can see a kind of breakdown of all the different categories that we have. So, What you'll see is that there's at the bottom here, there's excess and deficiencies of revenues over expenditures. Um, so basically, you know, surpluses or or deficits. I am currently working on something to insert into the convention reports to explain this better. Because this is very, uh, it's actually misleading. Um, and the reason that it is, is that this number includes a couple of different things. If, if you just look at this, this, it looks like, oh, we had an excess of $166,000. But this actually includes the one-time the one -time co contributions that were, that were put into the Ponder Anew. So that's overinflating the number. It also includes activity uh, for Lutheran Campus Ministry. So that's kind of throwing the number off as well, and like all of these numbers. So what I'd like to focus on a little bit more, instead of these kind of bottom line numbers, which I'll provide a better schedule to kind of explain it in the convention report itself, is to kind of jump down and look at the, look at the statement of changes in net assets. So basically, um, one of the things that the auditor is working on right now is it, it, I want this unrestricted broken out a little bit differently because I, the restricted actually includes money for Ponder and News. So this number is misleading as well right now. So I'll have this fixed in the final convention reports. But the way to look at this is that this investment in property and equipment, this is just the net val the, the, the net book value of the of the uh of the land and property uh, that uh, is on the U of A campus that LCM operates out of right now. 
So this is just basically the the net book value of that property. It doesn't um, it doesn't affect our cash or our operations. It just gets depreciated each year as an expense. This is the these are restricted funds that were received several several years ago, called the Rats Fund. Um, these these restricted funds do have specific uses for them, uh, and specific procedures of how they can be used. Um, similar to our deferred funds, where we can only use them for certain purposes, these restricted funds are the same. They, 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 can, they could possibly be used for operations, um, but, but they're restricted in the way that they're used. And then this unrestricted number, basically there's, there's money in here, or there's, there's balances in here. Part of it's for Ponder Anew. So really that should be restricted as well. And part of this, uh, part of this surplus unrestricted belongs to LCM Edmonton. So really what I'm trying to say is that the portion of this that actually belongs to the Senate is 169,000. So about 170,000. So what this number represents is, um, the amount of surplus that the Senate has over its entire existence. So um, these are, um, in a way, uh, future future deficits would reduce this amount, and future surpluses would increase this amount. Um, the a way of thinking of it is you, you've got. This money in your pocket, uh, you know, if you're if you overspend the next year, you need to use some of this surplus to help cover that. So, the things that I wanted to go through today were and uh, explaining how this where this number comes from, but also kind of telling you what's changed since the last time we met. So when we met at the last convention, so at the end of December. Uh, on December 31st, 2020, our our number for surplus was just over just over 260,000. And now three years later, that $260,000 surplus is 170,000. So that means that over the last three years, we've we've incurred a deficit of $90,000 over the last three years in total. So that's 260,000 at the end of 2020. Now it's 170,000. So that's where the $90,000 of deficit comes from. In addition to that, what's a little bit misleading as well because of the way the financials are, are shown is that the Senate has been using um, what are called CEC, uh, CECF funds are now mission funds uh, that are are held uh, are held at the national level for use across the synods, uh, and we've been using some of those funds to help subsidize our wages um, for both the uh, assistant to the bishop and then some other uh, some other purposes as well. Uh, in the last three years, we've okay. used. Uh, about $110,000 of CCF funds to help subsidize some of our wages. So without those funds, our deficit would be higher than it has been in the last three years. We'd be in more of a deficit. So my concern is, and uh, uh, is that, you know, right now, at the pace that we're going over the last three years, we've had accumulated deficits of 90,000. That really with, with the funds that we were using from, uh, from this pot of money that the national church has would be closer to 200,000. And we're, we're eroding our surplus, um, And so um, one of the things that we did a couple of years ago was we, we when we met as a Senate Council, was we chatted about our giving and, and how we were uh, 
forwarding funds to the National Church and to the Theological Seminary. We actually made a decision that we would decrease those amounts uh, in 2023. And uh, with a couple of notes regarding uh, this, that we had been giving the same amount for like a dozen years. So we were still giving the same amounts before uh, several congregations left uh, about 10 years ago. And so uh, we've been we've been given an increased amount, even though our 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 membership had been our congregational membership had been been decreasing. Um, but my concern is that uh, that we're still not able to fund the operations that we need to with where we're currently at. The, the benevolence seems to kind of hit a mark. We're at, we're at about 600,000. And I, I don't think it's going to change too much from that. Uh, all the indications this year so far is we're pretty much spot on where we were last year for benevolence. It's kind of hard. It's a hard indicator because we're only four months in, but things haven't changed too much. Um, so, you know, if we look at the balance sheet, you know, really the balance sheet is just a, summary of like all all the ways that we hold our assets like in in cash and term deposits it's marketable securities and then down on the liability side it shows like how much money how much of this these funds that we're holding are for deferred contributions and and where we sit right now we have enough to cover all of this you know we're not in danger of not being able to to uh to fund you know these liabilities that we're liable for but we are slowly getting to the position where our the surplus is eroding. And if that completely goes, then we do run into problems with cash flow issues. So that's kind of the Cole's notes of the financial statements. Um, I guess I'd open it up. Does any if anyone has any questions or comments regarding this? And I'm uh, spotlighted, so I can't see if anyone's asking questions, Karen. Because it's a reason. I have a question. Sorry, who? I, I, I have a question. Oh, Marcus. Um, Paul, um, what is the uh, National Church support based on? Uh, is it on uh, based on a certain percentage of the yeah. overall uh, uh, benevolence, or is it based on membership numbers in yeah. our church, in our synod? So, so the funds that I'm talking about, are the so are were originally called the CCF funds. Those are the church extension and something fund. I can't remember now. That's changed its name to the mission fund, and uh, the 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 formula for distribution is that it's like uh, the, all there's. There's about a um actually sorry Paul I'm I'm asking about uh, the the expenditure of the synod towards the national church oh I see what you're 000. saying yeah, yeah no that's it? just based on there's no real formula for like it's never really been based on that I've been able to see at like a per member contribution it's always just been an amount. That there is no formula uh, for yeah, it. It's it, just whatever yeah, it, we can afford. Yeah, and all of the notes that I found from uh, Stephen's notes, I think it was based on like a percentage of the benevolence we were receiving, because that's what it usually is. Um, but I, I just couldn't find anything specific about how we, how how it was calculated. So it's kind of based on whatever we can afford to support these the, the organizations with. About 15, um, it's about um, uh, 20, uh, 20 of our benevolence goes to those two organizations. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions from anyone? Paul? I guess I have a question too. So it's it's the yeah. other half. It's Andrea. Yep. 
Yeah. Uh, and this is the, the benevolence contributions. Is that um, the benevolence that the synod receives from the different uh, congregations? Yeah. Yeah. So the benevolence contributions all come from, you know, 95% from congregations, some individuals, but for the most part, that's all from the congregations. Thanks. You're very welcome. Dr. Heidi? But just to clarify, it's a portion of the benevolence that goes on to the national, not all of it. We obviously retain a, a large portion for the running or for our synod, yeah. and then it moves on to the national church, and then on to Lutheran World Federation. Uh, th that's correct. Well, for sure, yeah. Our yeah, we send a portion of our benevolence to the national church to help support the national church's operations. And then whatever the national church's budget is for what their, uh, yeah, what what they contribute to is kind of dealt with on their financials. Yeah. So like national is supported in a couple of different ways. It's supported through synodical, uh, through gifts that were through benevolence that the synods send. And then also the national has other ways that it's supported through um, uh, investment income, uh, I believe there's some like investment income that it uses to support itself and stuff like that. So, uh, I think I saw Pastor Tim put his hand up. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, <clears throat> begin with just with a word of thanks and appreciation, Paul. Uh, wonderful uh, and accessible explanation of, of our synod's uh, finances. So thank you for that. Uh, I don't really have a question other than a thought, that it seems that if we have about $180,000 left in our surplus, and if nothing changes, financially, our synod has about six years left. Uh, is that a, a harsh but realistic assessment? Yeah. So that thank thanks for bringing that up. That's definitely um, one of my concerns is that um, the viability of the synod, the way that it's structured right now, is a concern. Um, now, I should note there's a couple of things that we can do to alleviate some of these, um, just like church council met uh, to approve the budget a couple of years ago. And we made some adjustments to the national church and the theological seminary support. Um, I, I'm having a meeting with um, with the group with the with council again to bring them up to date and have a discussion around the possibility of changing those amounts again going forward. In addition to that, on the national level, I meet I meet uh, pretty much monthly with the synodical, the other synodical treasurers and the national church. And I've started what hope is a fruitful conversation regarding um, some of these mission fund, funds that are held and, and how, uh, because being, being upfront and honest, we're not the only synod in this situation. This isn't just an Alberta, Alberta and the territories problem. This is a, a problem across a couple of our synods. So, uh, us as a group have started conversations that I hope to um, get to the NCC level where we can have more discussions about what this might look like. But I think given if, given thinking what we can control on our end, I, I'm thinking that we need to have a realistic conversation around what we're giving to National and the Theological Seminary and, and try to re, uh, reassess if we need to adjust some of those amounts. Does anyone have any thoughts or questions around that? There's a question in the chat. Paul, if you have the chat or do you want me to read it to you? Yeah. Are there any plans or ideas yet on how to acquire more, sur more surplus instead of just being more careful in spending? And that's a great question. So one of the things that uh, Bishop Larry has done is he has um, created the... Um, Resource Generation and Task Force, uh, uh, Resource Generation Task Force, which is we've been together for about four years, four, four years now, 
I sit as an ex officio member on that uh, task force. And um, so we, the, some of this conversation is around like why, why we started the Ponder a New Vision Fund. Um, and and uh, so there are funds that come out of that that um, can be used in different ways to help support some of the ministries that we, uh, across our synod. Um, and then in addition to that, the group is also involved uh, um, in thinking of different ways to create uh, uh, more benevolence across uh, across the board. You know, the, the, the problem that we have uh, is that we, um, as, a, as a synod, we rely on, on the giving from the congregations. And of course, as many of you are aware that the, you know, uh, congregations are struggling just as much as, as we are in many cases. Um, but I think there's lots of opportunity and, and I think it shows the importance of discussions across the board um congregationally and and synodic like across synods how uh, are there ways that we can deal with this and and try and shore up some of our finances um and i, I won't go into detail what some of my thoughts are but I, I think that congregations need to talk to each other more and um i know that synods and national are uh, that's my push as well is that we have conversations on those levels as well. Well, there was another a question. Are the funds received from the National Church that has covered the staff and other expenses limited or annually decided? So that's a great question. So um, the way that the fund is set up right now is that uh, every, every synod is allocated a portion of the investment income from these uh, mission funds. And right now, the mission fund wording of the use of it is kind of loose. Uh, it says that the mission funds can be used for, um, uh, sorry, my brain just went blank. But um, it, it, the, 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 the explanation of how they can be used is kind of loose. Um, now the, the mission the mission fund does have a group that are working on that um, but to kind of figure out what the new direction or what the wording of that fund should be and nothing's been finalized. But essentially um, there's there's no real guidance from uh, uh, there's no real guidance on how much you can or cannot use. Being honest, I don't think that the the true intention of the fund was to help to fund synod expenses. However, there's three synods right now that find themselves in a position that they would not be in operations if they weren't using some of these funds to help subsidize their wage costs. So at the um, at the suggestion of the national uh, uh, the national treasurer uh, Gene Bullish and he. When I spoke with him, he said that if you know, for now, if you guys need if you guys need to use the funds to help support wages, until we get together and and try and figure out what this might look like, that you should go ahead and do that. So, um, that's probably a long winded way of it's not limited. It's kind of annually decided when I'm preparing the budget how much of that we may need to support our our operations. Any more questions? I'm just trying to look through here. I don't see any more in the chats, um, and I don't see any hands up. I don't see any either. So I guess before I hand it off to you, Karen, I guess what, what I'm committing to is that um, I'm, I'm working right now on something, hopefully, <laughs> that will make this... Uh, uh, more understandable of like kind of how the deficit is calculated when I'm doing my reporting. Um, but, but again, it's just, it's so complicated. Uh, I find, unfortunately, our financial statements are bound by the rules of the accounting world. And so they kind of have to be what they are. Uh, but I'll do my best to kind of break it out and explain it uh, uh, with the report that I put in the convention report. And then... Um, 
yeah, like I guess the takeaway from this is that I, you know, everyone, uh, just to one one step away from here. If anybody has any questions, if you're able, just to kind of summarize, or this will be recorded so that people can kind of go through this again. So, perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I know it's not easy um, when you're trying to to explain things that are very complicated for most of us on a daily level, but I really do thank you for your patience and thank you for all the work that you've put into this. We, it's really appreciated. And we look forward to hearing more from you at the convention as well. So thank you very much. So thank you too to all the delegates that are present today, uh, to our presenter, Paul, and to our technis, technical support, Emma. Um, delegates will be soon be receiving their bulletin of reports. Of course, there's been a lot of going on with the changes of venues. Um, so we hope for your patience and understanding, but they will be, we will soon be receiving them. And you'll also be receiving information about the convention banquet, um, including how to purchase additional tickets, information and re registrations for the Sunday and Monday Lunch and Learn workshops uh, will also come out. And those who have registered as visitors will be receiving information as to the cost of meals during the convention. So please mark your calendar for the next and final pre-convention Zoom meeting, Tuesday, May 21st, again, from 10 to 11.30 or 7 to 8.30, which will focus on our Senate's constitution and our bylaws. You meant to say May 28th. Oh, that's right. It is May 28th. Thank you. Um, today's recording will be made available on the Senate YouTube, so you can go through it again if you'd like to previously, previous to our next convention. I thank also Ben and Madeline, Leo and Ari for our worship today, and we're going to conclude with, with that. Please again, join with the singing as you do it so that we can all learn this. Even though you're muted, it's a great way to learn it so that we can do it in person at the convention. So we'll now hear the final conclusion uh, worship service. May peace be within and ever before you. Together with all the faithful across every time and place, we pray as our Lord taught us using the words knit upon our hearts.
Thanks to you, God of all mercy and consolation, for revealing your divinity in Jesus Christ, the living word, the Lamb of God who bears the weight of the world. In him all righteousness is fulfilled. Through him we are nourished with the bread of life. Just as the Samaritan apostle at the well discovered living water in her encounter with Jesus, so too have we been refreshed and transformed by our remembrance and thanksgiving. Elevate our faith, O God, to meet you in one another, setting aside our cracked jars to carry your living water into the dry places of the world. May we live as streams of mercy flowing to and from the wellspring of eternity. Amen. God is, love does, in the footsteps of grace we follow. Thank you everyone for attending today and I look forward to seeing you all again on May 28th. Thank you.